Brothers and sisters, what is this book? Bible, somebody said, Word of God? Amen. You think you can trust it? Well, I wonder why you think that. Because your mom or dad raised you? They told you you can trust it? Some guy on TV said you could trust it? Your pastor told you you could trust it? You're just trusting somebody else? He's told you so you do it? Because I'll tell you what, we've been talking about, ever since 2015 started, we've been talking about death, haven't we? Well, we have a cross behind me. Because there's a claim 2,000 years ago that a fella died and rose again and promised that everybody who would put their faith in him would also rise. Well, I want to know if this book is legit. We're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ today in Mark chapter 16. I, uh, you hear silly things a lot. One of the silly things I hear, and I've mentioned this before, is that Christianity uh, didn't develop in Jerusalem, in, in, in Israel, develop among Greeks and later imported back, which is totally contradicts uh, so much evidence that we have. <clears throat> and one of the pieces of evidence that I was thinking about as we sang this song, I Will Rise, uh, there's an ossuary, a, a bone box. Uh, there's a, a family buried their bones in boxes. In, in Jerusalem, which was common. That's the way they did it. And we know these people were Christians because of the symbols on the boxes. Uh, they would draw a fish. They had a symbol of a, a whale regurgitating a head, which was Jonah, which was a symbol of Jesus coming back to life. That's one of the first Christian symbols. Uh, not just a head, the whole body, but just the head was sticking out of the fish. Sorry, I had to clarify. <coughs> uh, well, that bone box... In, there's so many Christian bone boxes, was probably placed there between, somewhere between after the death of Christ, somewhere around 30 A.D., maybe 30, between 30 and 40 A.D., and, and then uh, before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. So it's very early, and of course we find all sorts of Christian uh, relics from that time period right after the death of Christ. But the reason I thought of it when we say, I will rise, is because the box had a phrase on there. It said, I will rise on eagles and no more sorrow, no more pain. The box said, I am Jehovah and I raise. I raise. It said it twice to emphasize it. And, they, and this is our very first generation of Christian brothers and sisters. We've got their bone box and on it says, I'm God and I raise. I raise. The first generation of Christians right there in Jerusalem believed it. And we believe it too because of the witness that's come down to us through the ages, because of the absolute trustworthiness of this book. Let's turn to Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> We're going to take our time and read the whole chapter, and then... If those of you who have footnotes in your Bible, maybe some of you have noticed this, maybe some of you have never noticed this. The entire second half of Mark is disputed. In other words, uh, many people, uh, Christians and non-Christians, think that Mark probably wasn't part of the original text. We're actually going to take time with that today. and you're gonna, Some of you are going to sit back there and think, I don't care. Why do we have to take time with this? Well... Just shut up. <laughs> Be quiet. And uh, the reason we're taking time with this is because not every message is for you. Uh, we're going to talk about this because this does concern some people. And there are people who are blown away by that when, their friend, when they say, I believe the Bible, and their friend says, well, how can you believe the Bible? It's so screwed up. Do you know the second part of Mark isn't even supposed to be in there? And they look at their own Bibles, and it says that. And some people start to get afraid, and they think they can't trust this book. And if you can't trust the book, then what do we know about Jesus Christ? And if we don't know anything about Jesus Christ, how do we know that our faith means anything at all? And so I don't care about the people who don't care about this. I mean, I love you. I, 
But I, your opinion doesn't matter on today's sermon uh, because this is what we're going to do. It's going to be of more benefit to some people than other people, and some people are going to be unhappy with my answer, and that's fine. Take it between you and the Lord. Verse 16 from 1, and we're, we'll get to that at the end of the reading. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome uh, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body uh, because he was dead and in the grave. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Isn't that an interesting thing? It's, they're here and they want to bless Jesus' body. He, they loved him. He died on the cross. They were there when he died. And uh, they want to now, you know, kind of like an Egyptian mummy wrap thing, they want to put spices on his body just as a way of loving uh, him and appreciating him. But there's a problem. There's this big, giant boulder that was rolled over the face of the tomb. And these gals are going to say, you know, we can't push that away. Who's going to move the stone to the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. And incidentally, throughout all the Bible, angels are continually saying, don't be afraid. Don't be alarmed. Uh, I don't know if they think that's humorous or not, but they tend to have that effect on people. And they were alarmed. And the angel said, don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. You're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. You notice this whole last chapter, this shock, this trembling, this fear. People just don't rise from the dead. And this had a profound effect on them. Now, most of your Bibles will probably have a, a statement here. They have the rest of it in italics. Mine says the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. Uh, Mark, throughout the beginning of the book, is fast-paced. This is the shortest section on the resurrection of Christ found in the scriptures. And again, what things that Mark does is action, action, action. And he keeps bringing us back to this fear, this awe, this trembling before Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was an was a, a, a individual that shook people up. And here at his resurrection, see the reaction? Fear, bewilderment, this sense of awe. Uh, uh, don't, uh, the angel said, don't be alarmed. And so this is the way that uh, some people think that the book of Mark was finished up here with this idea of, here is the risen God. It shakes people up. It shook them up. Now, what are you going to do about it? Okay, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's see. From the angel again, verse 6. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. Then you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and re reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to leave those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, go into all the world. Here's a different version of the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be damned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons they will speak in new languages. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he was at the right hand of God. Uh, verse 19, incidentally, is, is often quoted uh, by uh, early church fathers. 
then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked uh, with them and continued his word by the signs that accompanied it. So we have this witness, this short testimony, 16 quick chapters, fast-moving action to action to action. And, and uh, there's some interesting things here grammatically. Verse 8 says, uh, because they were afraid. In the Greek, it actually ends with the word because. There are some speeches we have from Roman philosophers that end with the word because. There are no other ancient texts that end with the word because. Uh, if Mark ends with the word because, it's unique. It's not grammatically wrong, but it would be unique. But then when you get to verse 9, uh, it begins now. It, my version says when, but it says now. And everywhere else in the New Testament, when they say now, they're connecting with what just happened right before it. But here it says now and begins a whole different thought. So grammatically, it's a funny ending or a beginning to verse 9. Uh, one thing that's really sure is that 9 through 16... 9 through 20, is very, very ancient. Like I said, the church fathers, the, 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 at least the second and third generation Christians, and maybe Papias, who was a first generation Christian, uh, were alluding or, or quoting directly from the end of Mark here, 9 through 20. So if you look at your Bibles at the ending of Mark, you're going to see, like, who doesn't have a footnote for 9 through 16? Who doesn't have a footnote? Wow. So everybody's Bible here has a little footnote saying that this is not found in the, in the oldest and best texts. Uh, we don't know exactly the origin for this ending. Most scholars believe that it was unlikely part of the original text, but like I said, it's either part of the original text or it is like first, like at least second and third generation Christian. I mean, it's like the Didache. The Didache is not in the Bible, but it's right there at the beginning. It's like the, the epistle of Barnabas, or the gospel. Uh, never mind, I'm going to take that back because one of them is heretical and one's not. Something of Barnabas. It's either the epistle or the gospel. One of them's good, written by Christians. One was written centuries later, written by non Christians. Uh, and, 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 and like the Shepherd of Hermas, which is another very good Christian book. I've read all these. And uh, they're not in the Bible, but they're good things. The Didache is not in the Bible, but it's a good thing. Either this was intended to be in the Bible. Uh, why is it so different? And you can tell just by reading it that the language is different. Greek scholars all say the language is different, but even English, different versions, you can tell it's different than the rest of the book of Mark was written. And it could be that it was written by somebody else, but it was intended to be in the Bible. Like in the Old Testament, remember, we have the first five books, they're called the books of Moses, but they go on after he dies. They talk about his death. Just because uh, Mark wrote the Mark doesn't mean he had to write all of Mark. So that could be one possibility. Uh, it could be that it was added, uh, it, that he himself wrote it at a different time when he wanted to finish up the ending. He wanted to give a fuller, he decided, you know what, I'm going to add a little bit on to the end. Uh, so we don't know when it was, uh, when it came to be, but again, the oldest versions of the New Testament don't have it, but it could be that they lost it. So that the versions after them are actually the more accurate versions. I don't know. Uh, so the question is, does this mean you can't trust your Bibles? We talk about this stuff at Foundation all the time. I've told you before that this is not the only place in Scripture that is under dispute. In fact, different versions of the text, ancient text, are different. If you added up all the differences in the Bible, a lot of it are liturgical uh, differences. Like one place will say amen, and another translation will say amen and amen. A lot of it has to do with dates and numbers. One will say like 3,000, one will say 30,000. They're different. Uh, but there are some places, and the biggest chunks are, are uh, probably the uh, uh, Jeremiah. There are different versions of Jeremiah and different versions of Mark here, short and long version of the ending of Mark. If you add up all the differences out of all these pages, see all these pages? It'd be about two sheets of paper front and back. So that's a lot of differences. I mean, you're going to hear people say there's 100,000 or so different variations, and that's absolutely true. And the good news is, it's great that we have 100,000 different variations in the ancient text. It's actually more than that. The good news, that's good news, because we have like 30,000 uh, texts or fragments of texts. And when they say variations, they mean some places skip an uh. There's some places have the Greek equivalent of a the. Uh, some places flip, flip two words. <coughs> we have so many 
ancient texts written by so many scribes that there's small differences. So then you think, well, how can we know what it really said? Look at, how can we know? Well, the, the good news is we got these tens of thousands of ancient Bibles, and you compare them all, you find out which language they're coming from, and you see a discrepancy come in Syrian, but it's not in the Greek or the Aramaic. You say, well, the, then the Syrian was probably wrong at this point. And you get all these together, and God preserved the word. He could have done it two, one of two ways. It could have been magic that you and I could not possibly quote from the Bible wrong. That any time anybody copies the scripture, it's automatically exactly the way it was proceeding. Or he could have just whoosh. The, from the first start of Christianity, people were copying down the Gospels, copying down the letters of Paul, and they're going everywhere, and they're in different languages, and then we find what the Bible says by bringing it all together and saying, wow, uh, this is how God preserved his word. Uh, the word of God, I believe, and here's, we're going to start with this, is absolutely trustworthy. I am absolutely convinced there's nothing else like it that has ever existed in the history of the world. This book is rock solid. But people have this question, does that mean we can't trust our Bible? There are 11 verses at the end of Mark that most people don't think belong there. We're going to take some time with this. This is where, where most of our time is going to be spent today. We're going to take some time unpacking this because it's important. You need to know when we're talking about who can forgive my sin. Is heaven real? Did Jesus Christ die for my sin? Did he rise again? Will I go to heaven? How should I live my life? You've got to know if you can trust this book or not. So we're going to spend some time with it this morning. And again, some of you care, some of you don't care. This is for those uh, because there will be people who will be blessed by this and need to know that this is a trustworthy work. Uh, it's absolutely essential that we understand why we can trust our Bibles. And here's a hint. It's not because of a bunch of pastors 500 years ago got together and declared, you can trust your Bibles. This is not why. Uh, this is not based upon church authority or some translator's preference. We have incredible, amazing evidence, and I've already been talking about this morning, why we can trust our Bibles that has been handed down to us, uh, copied from sage to scholar to scholar to scholar to scholar uh, from antiquity. I remember when I first spoke about the end of Mark with my dad, it was two or three decades ago, and dad cautioned me because I was thinking, it looks like the end of Mark isn't supposed to be there, and dad says, well, where does that end? Do we just keep throwing out chunks of the Bible because we think we're smart enough to decide what's supposed to be in there and what's not supposed to be in there? Uh, it's a good question, and it's a, the concern is valid because there's a group of people today called the Jesus Seminar. They're, a, they're an interesting group of people. They get together, they're scholars, and they take portions of the New Testament, they take quotations of Jesus predominantly, and they decide, well, I think Jesus said that, or I don't think Jesus said that, and they have different colored marbles. And one color means, I really think this is a saying of Jesus. Another colored marble is, that's absolutely not a color of Jesus. And another color is, it might be, it might not be. And they put all their marbles together, and then they count which color has the most, and then they declare, this was a saying of Jesus, or this was not a saying of Jesus, or this, was absolutely, this could go either way, it may or may not have been. And what they ended up with is it turns out that most of these scholars uh, who, who aren't what we'd call Bible-believing Christians, most of these scholars pretty much don't like what most of the New Testament says, and they believe that most of the things that the Bible says Jesus said, Jesus didn't say. So they are in disagreement with who? Well, we've talked before that even if all those 30,000-some texts I've talked about, these, these entire Bibles or portions of Bibles or sometimes even fragments of papyri, even if those disappeared, we could reconstruct almost the entire New Testament just quoting from the first, second, third generation pastors because the first Christians were writing and quoting from, from the text already before it was even classed as a Bible. They were writing what Paul said, and in, in Mark's account, he said, and Matthew says, and they were sending these back and forth. They did it so much that we could use their letters to reconstruct the Bible. So there's another good one. This is how we know the Bible's trustworthy. Uh, so the first, second, third generation Christians <coughs> believed that what Jesus said in the Bible were the words of Jesus. Now, 2,000 years old, we, later, we've got guys saying, you know what, that sounds too uh, much exclusive. Jesus would never say something like that. Jesus would never say uh, anything about hell. And, and so they're just 
throw, throwing their marbles in, and the other people, oh, you also think he wouldn't say that. We're so smart. And they pat each other on the back because they're agreeing about, uh, they're voting with marbles on what Jesus said and what Jesus did not say. <coughs> and again, as it turns out, uh, most of the Bible doesn't sound like Jesus to them. My question is, if you throw out most of the Bible, how the heck do you know what Jesus sounded like? It, it, you're telling me he doesn't sound like how you would imagine him to sound like. Because you have no basis to decide what he sounds like if you're tossed out most of what he's recorded to have said, which again was believed and recorded by these first, second, third generation Christians, in addition to all these tens of thousands of ancient texts we have which verify the, not only the New Testament, the Old Testament as well. So let's, uh, let's not vote with marbles today. How about that? Let's start with that. Anyways, my soul depends on it. I don't want to vote with marbles. And uh, I've told you before, I don't think I'm particularly religious. It's not in my character, in my nature. And I would rather not be in church if it's not true. I'm here because it's true. It's absolutely true. I've, I've staked my life on it. I've staked, st I've staked my soul on it, my destiny on it, and I believe it. And, and I'm not just uh, one of those people who's given to jumping into dark places and hoping. Uh, the King James Bible was made in 1611. And when the King James Bible was put together, it was considered kind of a liberal, kind of a radical thing. Uh, instead of making an English translation, which was itself like a big deal, but instead of making an English translation based upon the Bibles that were around at that time, uh, translated from Latin, the language of the Catholic Church in the West, it was decided, they decided, we're going to go and get back all the ancient texts we can try to get back to the original Greek, and we're going to reconstruct the Bible by going back to the oldest text we can find. <coughs> so that was kind of a, a, a huge endeavor because it might disagree with the Latin at some points with the Bible that they already had for hundreds of years in the church. But they wanted to get back to the original, so this is a noble endeavor, and they said, let's, let's find the oldest text we can. The King James Version also contained 15 more books, the Apocrypha, than ours does, and the church had had these books for, for you know, 1,500 years. They, the church had had the Apocrypha. The reason we don't have the Apocrypha, and by the way, it was removed in 1885. So a lot of Christians say, you can't just choose not to have the Apocrypha in 1885. We need to have the Apocrypha in our book. The reason is, is because the Jews and the early church fathers always said these are good books, but they're not in the order of Scripture. And so Christians in 1885 said, yeah, these are good books. Go ahead and read them. But they're not of the order of Scripture, so we're not going to include them in the Bible. But there are people who are diehards that said the King James had it. There's no reason. You, can, you can't just say in 1885, cut out 15 books. And so they, uh, they think nobody's smart enough to do that. So they would say you have to have the Apocrypha in our text. And I would say go ahead and read it. You're going to see it's different. It's not of the same. Uh, it's not of the same. It's not inspired like the Scriptures. They're interesting books, but they're not Scripture. Uh, the, the issue with the King James Bible is they knew that scribal errors naturally come in over time. Uh, scribes re writing down something, he mentions something to his friend, he skips a line. You know, uh, he reads a text, some texts are difficult, and so he goes with one interpretation that better scholars have interpreted different in different languages. Yeah, I, I, I keep going like this, you know what I'm doing? It's like a tree. You have, you have this translation here and this translation here. And this translation gets copied, then gets copied by a couple people, and it goes this way and this way. In, in if you have one difference on this branch, then all the branches coming, twigs coming out of that branch are going to have that difference in it, right? In, but if you have the copies over here, and if we only had one copy of the Bible, how difficult. But again, we have over 30,000 either whole Bibles or portions of Bibles from the first few hundred years of Christianity, and that's in different languages from different places around the world there, from, from Italy to, to Syria to, to Iran to to Egypt, down to Ethiopia. I mean, we have all these different trees growing, and that's how even if a scribe gets an error someplace else, it only affects the ones after it. It doesn't affect the ones before it or in different places. You see how that works? That's a good thing, right? So that, we're, we, that way we're not stuck. Well, the thing with the 1611 uh, King James Version is they, they didn't have all the ancient texts we have today. So they were taking it from this point they wanted to correct the Bibles before them, and they took it from a good point. But today we have even more uh, ancient texts by an incredible magnitude. I mean, so much more 
than they were able to have at that time. Unfortunately, as I said, the only ancient texts they could get their hands on were only a few hundred years old. Today, we have texts that are uh, 1,500 years old. See the difference? We can go. So isn't that scary? They wanted to correct it, and they got texts that were only a couple hundred years old. Uh-oh, we just found these fragments inside an old monastery. It's, it, it was written in the, in the 400s. Oh, no. How is it going to compare to our Bible? You scared? This is the whole point of what we're doing today. Don't be scared. They get the, the older you get, you see, wow, this book is amazing. It's been incredibly preserved. Christians, if you've got a religion that believes that the scribes never made a mistake and it's magic, you have to be afraid every time archaeologists dig something up. Christians love to find new things because they keep confirming the text that we have. Isn't that beautiful? Dig up more stuff. We like it. <coughs> so uh, uh, since the time that King James was finished in 1611, researchers have found many, 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 many more ancient documents written on papyri, animal skins, even engraven on metal plates. Some of these ancient texts are only fragments of sentences. Others, like the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus, uh, are almost complete versions of the Bible. The Codex Sinaiticus is very old. It was written between 335 and 360 AD. Uh, it's, such, it's a huge book written on, uh, what do you call it, val 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 Anyways, animal skins. Uh, it's estimated that it took 350 animals to produce the pages of this huge book. And it's in great condition. In fact, when, when Constantine became emperor and Christianity was legalized and stopped the persecution of the church in the 300s for the first time, he commissioned three great, uh, 50 great Bibles to be made. And there's some who believe that maybe the Codex Sinaiticus and the, possibly the Codex Vaticanus are actually these, among these 50 Bibles that were made right there at the, at, uh, at the beginning of, of Christianity, getting this information out all the time. But Christians from the start were readers. Christians from the start were readers, and so you always had the Bible being translated, recopied, re uh, there was no printing, but I mean re rescribed <laughs> again and again and again down through the ages. The amazing thing is these two ancient Bibles, the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus, are almost identical to each other. Well, that's big. They're almost, listen to this, they're almost identical to the King James written in 1611, although it was only made from, uh, from Greek manuscripts a few hundred years before it. In fact, it's almost identical, these two ancient texts, to the Bible you have before you. So when you hear people say that you can't trust this Bible because there's so many, and they're always going to talk about the end of Mark. When you hear people say that, they're ignoring the fact that 99.9% .9 of this Bible is identical, it's rock solid. And by the way, uh, one of Christianity's, uh, Bart Ehrman, one of Christianity's biggest critics, he was a Christian scholar who became an atheist, he admits two things. Jesus Christ is absolutely a historical figure, and the Bible, as you see it, is absolutely what the early Christians believed, and the Bible, you see it, is almost entirely what they had, and even the parts that he disputes, and he disputes more than a lot of scholars do, uh, he said, even if you take out all the parts that I dispute, none of the main doctrines of Christianity are whatsoever affected. And that's by Christianity's harshest critic, who's at least being somewhat honest in this respect. If you take out, remember I said there's about two pages front and back of disputed. You take out the disputed manner, most of it na names, dates, uh, numbers, in some uh, liturgical uh, flowery language. In, in the end of Mark, you take out all that. It does not affect one core doctrine, it does not affect anything core to Christianity, not even central core. It doesn't affect anything whatsoever. These are all matters on the periphery. And again, either God was going to preserve the scriptures by magic, so a scribe can never make a mistake, or he's going to preserve it by all these different texts in so many different places. Do you know there's nothing else like it in the ancient world? Uh, in the ancient world, we're separated by hundreds of years between a historical figure and their so-called memoirs. Christianity, boom, it's right afterwards. And, and we have only a few, and in the few that we have, even as recent as Shakespeare, we have different texts for his stuff. 
But we go back to this ancient, ancient stuff, and there's so many variations. We can come back and we can say, yeah, you can believe it or not believe it, but the people in Jerusalem, the very first, second, third generation Christians, they believed Jesus rose from the grave, and they were willing to die for it. And they were willing not only themselves to die for it, but to suffer to tell other people that this is real and you can find peace with God. This is what the early Christians believed, absolutely. So the Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, uh, agreement with each other, agreement with the King James, and agreement with the scripture you have before you today. There are a handful of verses different from our modern Bibles uh, that are missing the older versions, but the two biggest differences are uh, the order of the books in the New Testament are slightly different, which is kind of cool. They put Acts near the end somewhere, which I, I don't know why they did that. Uh, so the order, because they hadn't really grouped it all together yet, is a little different. And then verses 9 through 20 are missing in these earliest versions of the Bibles that we have. So here's the deal. The most ancient texts did not have 9 through 20, but many ancient texts do. From the ancient Byzantium texts to texts way down south of Egypt in Ethiopia, not all the Ethiopian texts, but many of them, uh, to Syrian texts have verses 9 through 20. Again, this is very old material. Uh, some of the texts, by the way, have even longer versions of the end of Mark than we do. Uh, see, there are actually six different ways the Gospel of Mark ends. That scholars have found out so far. There's six different ways that the Gospel of Mark ends, and I'm going to go through them for you. Uh, many of them, including our two oldest versions, it ends right at verse 8. Emphasizing amazement and inviting the hearers to respond. What are you going to do? Jesus wrote, risen from the gra grave. What are you going to do? A quick ending to the gospel that was always fast moving. In this respect, it would be like the book of Acts. Remember the book of Acts? It doesn't have a formal ending either. Uh, the book of Acts uh, ends in such a way that it says, what comes, we're supposed to think, what comes next? Uh, it doesn't have a proper ending. The short ending for Mark implies that the story of Christ goes on and we must respond to it. The abrupt ending for the Acts implies that the story of the church is ongoing and that we are a part of this continuing, ongoing story. Isn't that cool? When you read the end of Acts, it's, here's the church going out. And today, we're part of the book of Acts. Every church on the planet is part of the book of Acts because it's this ongoing story of the Holy Spirit in the, in, in the message of Jesus Christ spreading across the globe. So one possibility, and, and again, is that Mark was supposed to end at verse 8. Secondly, there's, there is the longer ending, and it's ancient. Again, if it's not part of the original text, it came very, very early uh, because it's actually quoted by some of the church fathers, including Arrhenius in 177 A.D. And Papias alludes to a guy drinking poison and not dying, so people wonder, did he know about this story? Or maybe was this story added because of the story Papias was told. However, we have records indicating that verses 9 through 20 were a hot topic of debate in the early church. In other words, you think, why do we have to debate it? Well, because the very early Christians debated it. The very early Christians debated whether the verses 9 through 20 were supposed to be in the church, and both Eusebius, church father, and Jerome both said, yeah, we've got some texts with these, this ending of Mark, but we're not sure of any of the old manuscripts that have the end of Mark that these texts have. So there's early church fathers saying, yeah, we don't, we don't have these. We don't know of any of them. The third way that the, some ancient Bibles conclude Mark are with one verse added after verse 8. So not the 9 through, tw not, not, not the nine through 20, just one extra verse. And it reads right after verse 8, And they promptly reported these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of the eternal salvation. Amen. So there were versions of Mark being passed around that thought, wow, Mark ends too quickly. We're going to add this little one verse kind of deal on the end of it to kind of wrap it up. Uh, which leads us to the fourth version, uh, which has the verse I just mentioned, that one that's not in your Bible, and they promptly report all these instructions to Peter and his companions. After that, Jesus himself uh, sent out through them east and west the sacred and perishable proclamation of eternal salvation. He has that verse, and then after that, it adds verses what we have 9 through 20. So it's even longer than our Bible because it adds this extra verse between verses 8 and verses 9. But that's not the longest version of Mark. And the longest version of Mark is not in your Bibles. The longest version of Mark has verses 9 through 20, but contains a verse, a long verse, between verses 14 and 15. Between verses 14 and 15, some ancient manuscripts of Mark add, 
and they excused themselves, saying, This age of lawless, uh, lawlessness and unbelief is under Satan, who does not allow the truth and power of God to prevail over the unclean things of the spirits, or does not allow what lies under the unclean spirits to understand the truth and power of God. Therefore, reveal your righteousness now. Thus they spoke to Christ, and Christ replied to them, The term of Satan's power has been fulfilled, but other terrible things draw near. And for those who have sinned, I have handed over to death, that they may return to the truth and sin no more, in order that they may inherit the spiritual and incorruptible glory of righteousness that is in heaven. So that's an even longer version of Mark that is probably not in any of your Bibles, but it was in a few ancient texts. Then there's a version, the sixth version, that ends after verse 14. So it's part of the long version, but it doesn't have the extra verse between 14 and 15, and it doesn't have 15 through 20. Six different ways that ancient books about Mark end. So who's smart enough to say which one should be, should we do the super long version with that part about Satan, Jesus, Satan's winning, you got to reveal your glory stuff? Uh, who took it upon themselves not to include all of these things in our Bibles? Why do our Bibles ignore several sentences found in some ancient documents? Even if your Bible has verses 9 through 20, it's still missing quite a bit. I just read to you two sections that are in the ancient documents, some of the ancient documents. Why was it decided that we shouldn't have the verse between 8 and 9? Who thought they were smart enough not to include the passage between 14 and 15? Well, the answer is actually simple. Uh, these verses are not found in the oldest manuscripts. In fact, they're not found until hundreds of years later. And that's the reason many Bible scholars include a footnote on 9 through 20 as well. I'm really comfortable with that. I'm really comfortable with that for two reasons. This does not bother me whatsoever. One, there has always been an intense debate, dispute, about the longer ending for Mark. The early church discussed the same thing we're talking about today. If the early church was unsure about how these verses make sense, uh, where they were unsure about these early verses, doesn't it make sense that you and I should be unsure of them as well, 9 through 20? If the early church said, boy, we're not sure about these verses, where do we get off thinking we're so smart that we could say, oh yeah, we're absolutely confident. We're not as smart as we think we are. The first church, the oldest manuscripts don't have it. Uh, Jerome, Eusebius said, boy, we, we don't know of any old Bibles that have this in it, old versions of Mark. And the early church themselves, the early Christians themselves said, this is a matter of dispute. And it makes sense then that most of your Bibles 9 through 20 have this footnote. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. That means nobody's trying to trick you. Oh, yeah, you can trust it. You can trust it. You can trust this Bible. You know why? Because there are very few things that are footnoted saying this is under dispute. Do you hear me? If we had a bunch of scholars sitting around saying, no, we can't let people know about that because then they'll be afraid, then I would, I would say, hey, give me the information. You can't decide that for me. I have more faith in this Bible because Christian scholars are so honest and they're saying, boy, you know, some of these older texts don't have this. And I have very few footnotes in my Bible. And you could go to something called the Net Bible, the New English Translation on the, on the Internet. It's an updated Bible where as they dig up more stuff, they update it. And you could go through it, the most footnotes of any Bible ever. They give it alternate readings, different translation streams or whatever. And that Bible is rock solid and it's basically the same as you've got in your hands today. And this is the most honest. So all those people running around saying, you can't trust your Bible because this and this and this, they're ignoring the fact that page after page after page has been unbelievably preserved, like nothing else in history, like nothing else in history. You can trust this book. And again, even like Bart Ehrman says, they, this enemy of Christianity, he says, yeah, even if you take out the stuff I dispute, not one central tenet of Christianity is affected. The core of Christianity has been preserved marvelously. Not the core, the, the vast majority of this text has been preserved marvelously. So it makes sense that we footnote it because the early church actually disputed this. Uh, we don't have verses eight and, uh, the verse in between 8 and 9 in our Bibles. You don't have the verse between 14 and 15 in your Bibles because it's not found for hundreds of years later. That's not, we don't need to add those. Those are obviously written by somebody who thought Mark ended it too quickly. I gotta, I gotta make a wrap up. And probably they didn't intend that to be considered scripture. They were probably writing a wrap up for their readers and, and very innocently included that, not thinking I'm writing scripture. It's just a scribe saying, let's wrap it up. We know what the, how the other gospels end. Let's just say what happened here. 
The co two competing earliest versions of Mark are the ones that end after verse 8 and the one that has 9 through 20, and that's why most Bibles have both. So having the longer version footnoted makes sense to me. And if you don't like footnotes in your Bible, I want you to keep a couple things in mind. First, the King James Bible in 1611 had 8,000 footnotes. Footnotes is not a new idea. Oh, actually, it's a lot older than 1611. Secondly, the ancient texts your Bible is based on, full of footnotes. These ancient Greek documents have footnotes off the side. This is not found in some documents or some scribes this way, or some people think the name should be different. The ancient Greeks, Christians, were writing footnotes off the side of their Bible. It's not a new thing. It's not a new thing. Uh, full of scribal footnotes, the ancient Greek documents. Secondly, that brings me to the second point. I'm very comfortable with our modern Bibles, including 9 through 20, with a footnote because the oldest Christians actually did the same thing. Did you hear that? The oldest Christians footnoted 9 through 20. Of course, they didn't write 9 through 20. They didn't have, not until centuries later did they have chapter, and then first there was chapter, and then a couple uh, generations after that they added verses to it. Uh, the early Christians did the same thing. As we noted earlier, the oldest and most complete manuscripts do not contain the long edition ending of Mark. And both Eusebius and Jerome both note that they're not even aware of any of these verses being any of the old manuscripts that they could get their hands on. So many of the manuscripts, but many of the manuscripts did include the longer version. It was even quoted by Irenaeus, as I said, possibly Justin Martyr. And Papias talks about the guy drinking poison and not dying. Uh, so many of the ancient texts do have it. And so we say, well, a lot of ancient texts have it. We should have it. Here's the thing that people don't tell you. A lot of them that have it, they're footnoted. Way back there, they were footnoting it. So many of the ancient manuscripts that did include the longer version do so with a footnote saying that the longer reading is either doubtful or uncertain. That's what they said uh, right there at the early part of Christianity. Some noting that the earlier text lacked the verses. Other manuscripts have a mark called an, I never knew this until I studied about it, called an obli, an obli. It looks like a division symbol, a line with a dot before it. It functions like an asterisk for us. And they would put an obli by verses uh, next to 9 through 20. And uh, an obli was a symbol that the ancient Greeks used to mark a passage that was believed to be corrupted or spurious. And so we have these ancient documents that our Bible is burst on. And the first Christians, these first few generation Christians, are saying, boy, I'm not so sure about this passage. So don't freak out if your Bible has a footnote. The early Christians had footnotes on this very section. So we have six possible endings for Mark. What do we do? We do exactly what most Bibles are already doing. This is the good way to do it. Put it in there. It was quoted by early Christians. It's either supposed to be there or it was added super early, and this is what early Christians were thinking. We include 9 through 20 with a footnote indicating that it's not in our oldest and best ancient texts and that the early church was unsure of what to do with it. The other four possibilities are all later. They have less support. There's no reason to have them in Scripture. It seems like the best two possibilities that end Mark at verse 8 or the longer version were, were either one of those two were probably the original. And here's the thing. Unless you are an Appalachian snake handler, you really don't need verses 9 through 20. Unless you are an Appalachian snake handler, this is not a big section uh, to, to, uh, to come to grips with. You're going to run into people who are going to try to shove this down your, down your, I wrote faith, but I'm, I, mean, I think I was thinking about push this in your faith, face or something. But anyways, shove this down your faith is what I wrote. Uh, there are going to be people who are going to say, look, look, you can't trust the Bible because there's a footnote on the end of Mark. The exact opposite is true. I could trust it because the scholars are so honest. They're not hiding any discrepancies. They're admitting every one of them. And I'm looking at a book that is rock solid. I am a biblical literist, and I believe that the Bible is the inspired, authoritative word of God. People who want to point at well-known facts like the shorter and longer versions of Mark in the New Testament and the shorter and longer versions of Jeremiah in the Old Testament are totally missing the point. They've missed the plot, as we said a couple weeks ago. Yes, the early church was unsure what to do with 9 through 20 because they were so careful. We're, the church has been so careful with the preservation of the doc, docu, documents, that's why we know when there's some discrepancies. And still today, we do the same thing they were doing with a footnote. Uh, but you know what? Because these guys are missing the plot when they're so hung up on 9 through 20. You know what's not in doubt? Well, pretty much 
pretty much everything from Mark 8 and before in Luke and after. I mean, again, there's uh, two, and two pages front and back in dispute. But this whole, you're missing the point, fixating on 9 through 20. You know what's not in doubt? Nobody doubts Mark 16, 8. Nobody doubts pretty much all the rest of Mark. There, there's some flowery language in one of the verses that may have been added later. Uh, nobody doubts this entire story of Jesus Christ, his miracles, his, his death, his resurrection was believed by this first generation of Christians. The part in doubt, this added on part at the end, talking about snake handling and poison and stuff, go ahead. If you believe it's there, that's between you and God. If you believe it shouldn't have been there, that's between you and God. But for somebody to try to unravel your faith, when, when, the central, when everything else is not in doubt, is crazy. And you know what? It was really sneaky and tricky and smells like sulfur. An honest scholar knows that you can depend on your Bible. An honest scholar might say, I don't believe that these things actually happened, but this is obviously what the original text looked like, and this is obviously what the original Christians believed. But that's not the way they present it. They present it as they're whispering, you can't trust your Bible. You, you, got, you, you can't depend on this Bible. Missing the plot, missing the point, or perhaps intentionally <laughs> trying to diabolically unravel people's faith. See, when people point at the end of Mark, they imply that the entire Bible is corrupted and that the original meaning is lost to us, but it's exact, actually the exact opposite. We know about corruptions. Why? Because we've got so many documents and we know the rest isn't corrupted. Did you get that? We know about two pages front and back of material that's in doubt because the rest of it is not corrupted. And that's the big story that everybody should be talking about instead of something like the end of Mark. This is a big deal. Because if this book was all corrupted, like people say, and if you really can't know what the original is talking about, like people say, then you, your faith would be in vain, and you would have no confidence about the death, the resurrection of Christ. You wouldn't have any confidence about heaven. We know, we know that this book is rock solid, and I've just shared with you the reasons why this morning. Don't let anybody whisper in your ear. Don't let anybody trick you because they don't know what they're talking about or they're just being nasty. So why did I take so long with this controversy? Well, one, it's because well, that's the kind of church we are. You know, every time there's a controversy, we take it head on, whether it's coming from outside the church or whether it's in Scripture and it's disputable. We've always just, we don't, you know how some people have told me, our church has never talked about this. Or the pastor yelled at me for raising questions. I haven't met churches like that. Honestly, I don't know anything about that. But I've heard about it. Well, we're not going to be that kind of church. If there's something to discuss, we're going to discuss it. If there's something in doubt, we're going we're to talk about it. I have never asked you to believe something because Dan said so. I've never asked you to do that. Or because the medieval Catholic church decided it was so. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, Mark 9 through 20, absolutely in there because medieval Catholic Church said so. I've never asked you to do that. I wanted to take time with this because sometimes people honestly wonder. It's an honest question or even have doubts. And my belief, my belief has always been if, if God is real and if this book is true, it can stand the light of day. Amen? Yeah. Amen. It can stand the spotlight. Bring it. Ask the questions. God's a big God. His feelings don't get hurt when we ask questions. Because we know, brothers and sisters, we know death is real. We know heartache is real. We know disappointment and regret are real. We know that sin is real. And we better know that our wonderful Savior, written about in this book, is real as well. Amen. Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's, he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. 
But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just, uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step, leave your comfort zone at home, uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area, and I'm sure you're going to go there. You're going to be loved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. People are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home, but we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to, to, to know God better and to allow him to reach into our lives and... and uh, let his grace rest upon our lives. So uh, again, I just want to encourage you. Thank you for watching. But if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Hi, this is John with Foundation TV. You know, Foundation Church is a small church uh, here in Janesville. We do a lot with the size of the congregation that we have. Uh, and we've been really pleased to host Foundation TV for many years. Uh, however, due to budget constraints, we're no longer able to do that at this time. Uh, if you would like to find Foundation TV, we're still available on YouTube uh, at the address below and on local access channels 98 and in HD 994. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.